live from the 607, it's the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour, where we're talking everything movies, TV, comics, and entertainment. Join in the conversation on social media with the hashtag ODPH, because here we go. Welcome to an all-new edition of the ODPH Podcast. What's happening, everybody? My name is Ken M. Joining me in studio, as always, you know him. He's the co-host. His name is Padawan J. Let me talk to you. Yeah, and boy, do we have a lot to talk about in the land of movies, TV, comics, and more. You are tuned in to the entertainment edition of the ODPH. And we definitely want to keep that conversation rolling after the show. So, Pad, where does everybody go? ODPHpodcast.com. Right on. Swing on over to the website. Sign up on all the social media accounts. Everything is blowing up right now, which is lovely to see, folks. Can't thank you enough for all the interactions we've been getting lately, and the follower numbers are growing up. Like, everything is just growing and growing, and it's just mind-boggling at this stage. But, hey, I'm not complaining about it one bit. As the saying goes, business is a booming. Exactly. So while you're there, also check out the T Public store. There's always something going on there, so you definitely want to click on over, see what logos are getting made in the T-shirts, coffee mugs, you name it, it's getting done there. And a lot of things are going to be going on sale soon, so definitely keep an eye on for that. Also, while you're at the website, check out the Patreon link, patreon.com slash podcast. one tier, $2 a month, and bonus content on the way. Also, we have the blog section. We're always doing reviews left and right. The classified section, which has friends of the show such as 3FN Podcast, Dragon Master Games, Nerd Initiative, and many, many more. Also, Pat, how many providers are we on? 263,789. I don't argue with him because he is a statistician to the stars. So if you click on over to the directory page, you can find uh, links to whatever podcatcher you is your preference, and you can subscribe to the show, and it definitely helps the algorithm out. And drop a five-star review while you're there, too. I mean, it definitely helps out to get the word of what is going on here at the Parlay of Topics home base. Mm-hmm. Also, check out the music section, which has friends of the show, such as Brian Wolf and the Howlers, who made a big announcement if you live here locally in the 607 for this summer. So you definitely want to check out everything going on with him. Shout out the Robots. Floodlands. Let me take a quick second to talk about Floodlands. Okay. Floodlands decided to do a cover of a certain song entitled I Want to Be a New York Ranger. Oh. So if you want to find out about that, that's starting to take off on social media. So you definitely want to go check that out along with their brand new album that's out. Second suitor, Tom Jolo, the list goes on and on. Basically, if it's anything and everything that is the ODPH, you can find it at odphpodcast.com. And always remember on social media to use the hashtag ODPHpod. There's a lot there. There is. There truly is. So that's why I say, if I missed anything, go to the website. But first, you have you came here to hear us break down a lot of going ons in the land of entertainment. Yeah. And let's be honest, it's a mutant world right now. Yes, it is. No matter where you turn, there is something going on involving Marvel Comics slash Marvel Entertainment's X Men franchise. Yes. So we are definitely kicking off with. I'm going to go out on a limb. And I know this is going to sound a little crazy. Okay. The X franchise property that is blowing up the most and right now it's undeniable yes it is x-men 97 the animated sequel slash revival of the hit fox uh, cartoon from the 1990s 1992 to 1997 to be specific has reignited a fan base that literally cannot get enough of this show and, right. and rightfully so. Yeah. I mean, not obviously bearing what we're going to talk about, but it literally has sparked pop culture's interest in the X franchise that when we go into what we're going to discuss in the second segment, there's no doubt why the numbers are that big. Mm-hmm. Like, we thought they were going to be huge, but I think, honestly, to the show, Pat, and correct me if I'm wrong, this ignited that fan base. I would say it reignited because the X-Men animated series from the early to mid nineties has always been popular. You know, it, it's always one of those, whenever you see a video on TikTok or Instagram or Facebook or YouTube, or even X Twitter, or whatever you want to call it these days, you know, where somebody's talking about the list of greatest cartoon theme songs, mm-hmm. Batman, the animated series is going to be on there. Sure. You know, Justice League, the original run, you know, not the Unlimited. There, Although there's nothing wrong with the Justice League Unlimited thing, but Justice League, I'm sure, is going to be on there. 
you know, uh, Superman uh, animated series is going to be on there. But inevitably, what a lot of people are going to put either in their top two or at number one is the original X-Men series. But it was so long ago that I think it's kind of kind of fallen into one of those you had to be there mm-hmm. kind of things where like you see the because for a lot of years, you know, obviously before streaming, you had to have the VHSs if they ever released them, the DVDs. You know, and and then the, like the streaming, I know briefly, like 10, 14 years ago when I first got Netflix, they were the show was on Netflix for a while, but then it kind of went off Netflix and I don't know where the heck it ended up because I didn't finish the series when it was on Netflix and I couldn't f- figure out where it was, you know, but it, it kind of felt one of those you had to be there moments. Yeah. And, and then with the series coming back. Like you said, you had the fans who were there. They got reignited. And they're like, yes, the series we love is back. The, the theme song is back. A lot of the same uh, folks lending their vocal talents are back. And then you had the fans who were like, all right, I missed this the first go around, but I want to be here for the second one. I'm excited for this. So it's kind of this blending you know, concoction. Yeah, but it's worked out splendidly. Yeah. And I don't think anybody was expecting it to take over pop culture as much as it has. I don't think so. I think people certainly knew it was going to be popular and knew it was like highly anticipated. But I don't think anyone expected to the degree it's as popular as it is. No, I think obviously it kicked in and really took a hold of an audience that was waiting to understand why the X-Men franchise was so big. We always talk about it with the MCU and yeah. like how monumental it was to see the end of the Marvels and that bonus scene <laughs> and what it led to. And then seeing what we're having coming with Deadpool and Wolverine, that's only having fans more excited. At, but this series, honestly, I think really kicked that all off, to be honest with you, mm-hmm. because it has really captured what people love about the X-Men. And right. if, if and obviously since they've been around since 1963 to present, yeah, they have made their mark in comics history. They've made their mark in pop culture, and that's why this show is winning as much as it has because it's retelling all these great stories and really diving into something that we're seeing now more and more in comics. Yeah, and that's characters first. Yes, and I love seeing that. So all of that said. If you're new to the show, first and foremost, thank you for checking us out. We really do appreciate it. What we like to do is give you a spoiler-free statement about what we're going to be breaking down. Then we're going to give you a countdown. After said countdown, we dive into spoilers. We hold nothing back. We put the timestamp in the episode. Pad does that for you each and every week. Mm -hmm. So that being said, if you haven't seen the episode yet that we're going to be discussing, entitled Bright Eyes, Episode 7 of X-Men 97. We are giving you fair warning now. After that spoiler countdown is done, we go deep diving. So you have been forewarned. But in the meantime, though, Pad, give me your spoiler-free statement on Bright Eyes. I'll be honest. I thought the episode was really good. Uh, I kept expecting the song from the Killers to play at some point during this episode. I thought it would have been um, you know, a nice little touch with the the theme song, the title of the episode. Um, But no, the episode was really good. You know, kind of took a little minute to get going, but crime and ease us when it really got going gut punch after gut punch after gut punch and and the setup and the multi and that's the thing i love with this we couldn't get this in the 90s mm-hmm. because fox had the rights to the x-men you know sony had the rights to spider-man you know and then everything else was was still at marvel you know and they're doing their own thing but it was all kind of separate universe iron man was its own cartoon silver surfer had his own cartoon hulk had his own thing and there was very rarely, if ever, a crossover. Now it's all in one house. Now mm-hmm. it's all under one banner. Now it's all in, in in you know one boat, if you will. And the and the setups they're doing with this, and the, and it's multi layered, and it's like you will to building characters and characters first. The setup they're doing for not just the the last three episodes we have coming over the next three weeks, but we know they're doing season two. We know they're they're planning season three. The the build they're doing for this is just incredible. Second best episode of the season. I would agree. Easily. What they're doing is they're connecting with the audience on that basic human level, Mm -hmm. even though we're talking mutants. Yep. You're you're having an emotional connection with the characters, and it's a lot due to the fantastic voice acting that is being done on this show. And where they have dived in to the story, like once we get really into the heart and soul of the matter here. Mm Mm-hmm. Things pick up another notch. Right. 
and we get some great reveals. One that I honestly was not expecting, and the minute I saw said character, I marked out because I know exactly who that is. I had to do some Google searching, and if you were one of these people sitting there saying, no, I predicted this from the start, no, stop lying. No, nobody predicted this. This is a deep dive, and I love the fact that they went there. Albeit, though, there is a rumor about who this person is supposed to lead into for the next season. Oh. I'm going to say pause on that, okay. and I'll, I will fully explain why when we get there. Okay. But overall, second best episode of the season thus far, a must watch. It starts a little slow, I will agree with you, but they, yeah. but it, but it pays off later. So there's a reason why. But it's still a great episode to watch, nevertheless. And I'm going to start spilling stuff in a minute. So let's get into that spoiler talk. In three, two, one, pad, talk to me. Like I said, episode was absolutely, once it got going, because it took a little bit, because you got to remember, uh, last week's episode was, you know, this the second part of Storm Story. So we hadn't really seen this portion of the story in two weeks. Mm-hmm. So they had to remind everybody, they had to refresh everybody. Let's face it, there's a lot of stuff going on on TV these days. So you might have forgotten. Once they kind of gave a refresher, once the, the tires got spinning again, uh, on the story, it was just hit the ground running. Absolutely incredible start to finish. And the, like I said, the setups they're doing for not just the next three episodes, but for the seasons and potentially shows, I, I would not rule out as well as this show is doing that they don't consider bringing back some of the other ones they did from back in the nineties and in doing runs with that, because it's all, it's all Marvel. It's all connected, you know, that kind of thing. But no, for this episode, incredible. I thought they really nailed the points that they're going into the final three episodes, which is wild to say that we're already here at the end game. I know. But they really sped up a couple things here. They really had a, a couple of fantastic emotional moments. And where we got the big reveal of who's behind this, Yeah, it's brilliant. It's a deep dive. I marked out. And you could tell that they were setting it up that way because just the way it played out. And then just that that ultimate like movie reveal of who it is. And you just sit there. And if you know, you go, oh, shit. And if you're me, you go, who the fuck is that guy? Oh, yeah. But for me, I marked. I was like, I have not seen this character in a high I, I could tell they were setting it up for like the big reveal of like, hey, this means a lot. Because it wasn't until like the last shot of the episode that they showed who it was. The character was in multiple parts or multiple shots of the episode, but they waited until literally the last second to show him. And I'm like, okay, this means a lot. Yeah, but where they're going to go with this, I f- oh, it's going to be a big payoff. I'm excited about it. And I, once we get into the episodes, like I'm going to I'm break down because I've heard an online rumor going around, and I'm like, yeah, to do that, that's a lot of moving parts, and I don't think mm-hmm. we're, we're at that stage yet. But I have a feeling where we're going after this. Yeah. And get ready. But where we kick off, the X-Men are burying Gambit, mm-hmm. who has been killed. So, like I say, there is no kind of gray area here. He's surrounded by members of the League of Thieves and League of Assassins, which ties into his backstory perfectly. You see his ex-wife, Belladonna, there. Yeah. And it's a very emotional scene, too, where, I mean, Nightcrawler is presiding and giving mm-hmm. final rites. And it, it, it's a very unique setup to, like, kick into everything here. Yeah. But I love the writing here. I thought what uh, Nightcrawler was saying was perfect. Yeah. And like I say, kudos to the the writers about this because I thought they really they captured that moment. Charlie Feldman and J.B. Ballard. Yeah, fantastic job with this. And the question was going around the X-Men was where was Rogue? Mm-hmm. And I love how they addressed this. I loved how they addressed this because they said everybody grieves in different ways. Yeah, they do. And it went back to like, you know, she loved him. He yep. loved her. Like, but you know, it never happened. But where is she? Uh-huh. So we do find out very quickly where Rogue is. And Pad, what is she doing? She is looking for Thunderbolt Ross. Yep. Because she is trying to find out where Henry Gyrick is. Right. Now, Gyrick in the cartoon, quote unquote, killed Professor Xavier. Right. So we we have those air hashtags right now. The other issue, or quotations. I should the say. other issue you run into is where the fuck are these sentinels coming from? Because as they alluded to in the show, there was the master mold built and there was the facility uh, they destroyed in the original original series, which I think we're led to believe, you know, was the only facility 
in existence that that had that capabilities. So they destroyed that, you know, however many years ago now in universe. Mm-hmm. You know, that's gone. And then they took out the one at the beginning of the season. So presumably, you know, hunky dory, everything's fine and dandy. You know, swipe your hands together. Hey, we, job well done. And yet, you see the news footage and everything's not okay. And, and you see what happened. And she ultimately feels, I think, a sense of of letting Gambit and letting all those other folks on Genosha down. Of like, we're supposed to be the saviors. We're supposed to be the, the front line defense for the mutant race and and we failed them. Mm-hmm. So Rogue is taken upon herself. She wants answers and she has to go through general Thunderbolt Ross, mm-hmm. which is an interesting uh, choice here, but <laughs> I, I'm not saying it's leading into red Hulk. No, just yet. No. I don't think we're going to go anywhere near that character on this show. Maybe someday, maybe someday, depending on where they want to go with the story, but I'm going to Hulk, Hulk was referenced. Hulk was referenced, but I don't think they're they're going to dive into there. Probably not. I, I just don't think. But it also does lead her into the cross uh, fire, if you will. Sure. Of one Sentinel of Liberty, mm-hmm. Steve Rogers, Captain America. You see the shield. You see the familiar costume, and you go, fuck yeah. Oh, yeah. So it was very cool to see Cap was doing his own investigation, too. And there is a little bit of tension there, too, because Rogue is more or less calling Cap out to publicly stand with the X-Men about what happened in Genosha. And it's a situation where they've kind of walked this line in the comics before, mm-hmm. where it's the, the persona of Captain America, not Steve Rogers, not Sam Wilson, not Bucky Barnes, but right. what Captain America is involved with. And they tied it back into a plot thread that... They they more or less did in the late '80s, mm-hmm. and this is what led to Steve Rogers getting fired and the U.S. agent taking over. Right, and they they played it into the political aspect, and I thought that was an interesting take mm-hmm. because he Captain America wants to bring Guyrick in, but he said there's a lot of red tape. I can't just go running into Mexico where they track him down to. Go get, go apprehend him because it will cause a big political you know, warfare here. Yeah, like he he knows what the right thing to do is, and he knows how to go about and do it, and he knows what you know. He knows it's the right thing to do, but he ultimately is a government man. He ultimately is a soldier. It's it's what his training is. It's you know what it's down to, and he knows like, listen, I can do this, but it's going to cause so many other issues that she can't see and she can't fathom right now just because she's so brokenhearted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's the one thing that Cap, being the level-headed hero that he is, is Mm -hmm. like, we can get Gyrick, but we have to do it this way, and Rogue being obviously an emotional wreck right now is not wanting to hear it. She grabs his shield and heaves it into parts unknown (laughs) and takes off for Mexico to go track down Henry Gyrick, who she does find. Yep. And does an absorption uh, powers, like I say, she does leech off him to get his memories and get as much information as he can. Albeit, though. Almost kills the damn guy. Almost kills him. Yeah. But she gets enough that she has an idea what's going on, even though there was a psychic attack. Yes, there was. Played here. Yes. So what was your reaction to that, Pat? Uh, a little bit of shock, a little bit of surprise. Like, at first I was like, yo, she's really going for the jugular here. Mm-hmm. She's she's really going for the shock value. But then I'm like, wait, she's going through, you know, the five stages of grief, and sh- she skipped them all and is straight to anger. You know, so I was like, okay, let's wait and see how this plays out. Yeah. But then an, a weird thing happens with one Peter Henry Gyrick. Mm-hmm. And what is that, Pat? He gets killed. Yeah. And this is something that we know has ties to Mr. Sinister. Yep. But we don't exactly know who. Mm-hmm. So once this plays into effect... Because he's a- acting real weird when they show up. Yeah. Like you, like you can tell, and admittedly, we've seen him for what, like two scenes mm-hmm. this, this season? Yeah. Uh, so admittedly, we're not like besties and, and can tell every detail about the guy. But still, when she showed up, even I was like, something's off on this guy. Well, the one thing about Gyrick is... And I'm not talking about his personality. Yeah, he has always been a thorn in the side of all superheroes. 
Yeah, he's, I can understand that. And it doesn't matter, mutant or not. I mean, he's always been a pain in the Avengers in the comics. You, you definitely get that vibe off of the one line he had, and I know they used it in the little, like, previously on mm-hmm. thing, where he's like, oh, I'm doing this for humanity. Yeah. So when he's taken off the board, that's a big move. Mm-hmm. And then the story shifts back to Genosha. Yep. And the X-Men are there trying to do their best help efforts. Tish Tilby is there working with Beast and, and trying to, like, do something with the image of the X-Men. Is she hitting on him? Yeah, they do have a romance in the comics. Ah, okay. Because so that... I got I got that vibe of, like, she she was. it felt like to me she was, and I, admittedly, I have not read every X-Men comic in existence. Mm-hmm. But, like, it felt to me that I'm like, she's clearly trying to do her job, but she's also trying to play that, like, I have feelings for you, and I'm just here to support you in any way I can. Mm-hmm. And Beast is, like, not in a place where he's ready to accept that. Yeah, there is there is some history with them in the comics. Okay. So that that's a great Easter egg for anybody that doesn't know the, the history of that. I want to say it was more during the Avengers run. Sure. Than when, when Beast was an Avenger. Sure. But there is also a cameo that... Unless you really know your X-Men history, okay. you're not going to know who this was. So that's not me. Right. So we do see they're talking with an Amelia. Okay. And she's one that's helping the Genosian relief. And if anybody knows her from the comics. Was that the person that was the nurse when they first showed up? That was yes. like, like taking care of triage and everything? Yes. Ah, okay. So she is one of Magneto's acolytes. Oh. So where we're going to go with this after everything's all said and done for the season, there's more to her involved. Yeah, I but, would imagine. But she is very loyal to Magneto and his philosophies on mutant-human relations. So what you're saying is she's buying into what he's selling. Oh, fully. Okay. Like one million percent. So okay. when we see her, that, that immediately tipped me off about who is lurking around too because we did see exodus yep who is also one of the acolytes and i have a feeling we're going to see another one mr fabian cortez sooner than later mm. and if anybody wants to get a jump start on that storyline x-men one with chris claremont and jim lee you're welcome but that being said so when they tie that in there it is very interesting to see that they're planting the seeds for that yeah but they don't really have time to pick up on that because they're contacted by boulevard trask mm-hmm and Pad, what is he telling them? Uh, that he he's in Madripoor. Yeah, he's tipping off like there's come find me. Mm-hmm. I, I'm being held against my will. I'll tell you everything. He even tells him about how to tip off a soda machine. Yeah, that's something that's always in stock, even though yeah, it says the, it the, isn't the diet, whatever it is. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it is interesting to see this. They do track down Rogue. Uh huh. And there's a very emotional scene with her and Nightcrawler. Yeah. Like Nightcrawler was the MVP of the season. I thought this. this I thought this was a hallucination scene. Yeah. It, Not gonna lie. It, it it kind of felt like it. I was like, wait, is she dreaming? Is this like all a hallucination? Because she got attacked or taken out right before they showed up or something. Cut to a different scene. Then it cut back to her, and I'm like, wait, is this all a dream sequence? Or and then I'm like, oh no, this is real. Yeah. So once they start, you know, having this emo- emotional moment, and I love how they did it because. Rogue and Nightcrawler are stepbrother and stepsister. Mm-hmm. And I love the fact that they, you know, explain that and and just the family bond there that they go through. So Well, and I think if there's ultimately anyone on the planet that can understand at least some of what she feels, it's Nightcrawler. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, Rogue, outcast, can't really touch anybody. You know, is really withdrawn from uh, from folks. And then there's Nightcrawler who's blue and looks like a demon. Mm-hmm. And and put it to you this way, he's not exactly the hit at the parties, you know, on New Year's Eve. I don't know. He is quite charismatic. Uh, that is true. <laughs> but I, I get what you're saying. So, I mean, it is a great scene, though, that yeah. they play off. Yeah. So with Rogue now back with the team, they head to Madripoor. Yep. There is a little side story that was going on, too. And I have an idea where we're going with this as well. Okay. And this is... Jubilee and Roberto, a.k.a. Sunspot, yeah. go back to Sunspot's family. Yeah. And he comes out and says he's a mutant. Yep. And she's like, oh, you know, I'm very supportive of you. <laughs> I'm a mother. I've always known. Yeah. But then immediately says, well, we have to keep this under wraps because yeah. of the stockholders. Yeah, which I saw coming a mile off. Yeah. So where I think they're going with this to kind of segue a little bit. Sure. I think we are going to get a version of Generation X 
in the cartoon. Mm. And if anybody is not familiar with that, that is the 90s version of the New Mutants. Sure. Uh, which Scott Lobdell and Chris Pacello uh, were the team behind. It's a great, sure. it was a great series. I will say one of my favorites of the 90s. And they really went back into like the young mutants, but they weren't exactly, right. you know, I would say um, like the, the, the CW-esque teenagers you see. <laughs> They were all very scarred. I'd love to see Chamber. I'm going to put that out there right now. Right. Um, but I think we're going to see a version of that play out with how they focus with Jubilee and Roberto on their own separate thing. Right. But I could see it. That'll be for next I season. Can, I can understand the name change, too, especially given recent history with the New Mutants name. Yeah. Not not exactly a, a warm, fuzzy feeling when you think about that, that movie. Right. But I think that that's where they're going to kind of play off it, too. Yeah. Uh, for the 90s, because like I say, if they were keeping everything in the 90s, yeah, yeah, that gener- makes sense. Generation X is going to be. But once the X Men get back on track here and we go right to Madripoor, this is where business picks up because we do see Boulevard Trask is there. Mm-hmm. So his information is holding up per se. Uh-huh. But we do see Rogue completely fly off the handle. Oh, yeah. And we start getting more information about what is going on here because she is basically shaking down Trask, who is, like, on the edge of a building. Yeah, on on a rooftop of a skyscraper. Mm -hmm. So once they find out what he knows, and that is Mr. Sinister is working with an organization known as OZT. Mm -hmm. And they've been doing what, Pat? Developing a super advanced uh, Sentinel program, like a human hybrid thing is the kind of vibe I got. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nothing good. No, it's nothing good. And then the minute I saw this, I'm like, oh, I think I know who's coming. Mm -hmm. And this is a deep dive, but I'm all here for it, being the comic fan that I am. Uh Uh-huh. But this is where Rogue does something completely off-center. Yeah. And she drops Trask. She plays good cop, bad cop, except there's no good cop. Yeah, except she is just so overwhelmed with her anger and grief that she <laughs> basically kills him. She, well, no, there's no basically. She does. Well, he, I, he, he, she, she tries. She does the whole like Batman. I'm going to dangle you off the edge of a, off of a building mm-hmm. and, and scare you to give me the information. He gives her the information and she's like, "Thanks, drop." And and I for, and everyone's shocked and like, "Oh my god, I can't believe she just did this." And I can't remember who said it. It might have been Morph. Uh, but somebody said, is this who we are now? Yeah. And you can tell it's starting to create some strife with just everything going on between Magneto taking over the X-Men for all of a cup of tea, Genosha and everything that happened at the UN, Genosha getting attacked, Storm losing her powers. That like this seemingly has been the in within the span of like, what, maybe two weeks? Mm-hmm. Not very long, and it's they're all just like at their wits on because this is just too fucking much. Oh, yeah, they're reeling. But yeah. once they find out uh, a secret has happened, and then Trask reappears. Uh-huh. And does a very horror movie-esque yeah, does. move and spins his head around a 360 and turns out that he is one of these advanced Sentinels. Yep. He is a hybrid. Mm-hmm. So he starts defeating the X Men with ease, and and what does it say? All oh, threat eliminated. Yeah, threat like with with ease. Yeah, like it, Cyclops opens up full tilt with his powers. Doesn't mm. remove the doesn't remove the the visor, but he cranks it to eleven. Yeah, like it like nothing even happened. Mm-hmm. Like no. it, like it's a uh, sunburn. Yeah, completely just erase, just nothing. Just Trask completely erases him off takes the board. Out, takes out Rogue in like one hit. Mm-hmm. So suddenly the things start shifting into the X-Men's favor because we do see a grenade-esque weapon get mm-hmm, dropped, mm-hmm. and it does take out Trask. I think temporarily. Mm-hmm. But who is the person that is responsible for that? Cable! Yes, we do see the return of one Nathan Summers mm-hmm. as an adult mm-hmm. and has a very, very awkward, awkward moment. This is, I have to say, if there's one thing I will complain about this episode, sure, it's this. Meh. This was way too one and done. It now sinks in. I mean, listen, Scott Summers is consistent. He didn't get a good bye with his kid. He doesn't get a good hello. No, it, it's true, but it was just like this happened way too soon, the reveal. Sure. That... Obviously, when they try doing a mind read, this is where Jean Grey picks up, and then yeah. son, Scott, who's not sees connected, the eyes. he sees the eyes suddenly. And All is of like, a sudden. He's like, Nathan? 
And he's like, mm-hmm. all right, dad, we'll like, we'll talk later. <laughs> we don't have time. Yeah. Which I, I was, that's the one thing I'll just, but I'm, this is like me just really being picky about, mm-hmm. but I'm okay with it. And this is where he explains the sinister is working with somebody else that they have to stop. So the person that he's been alluding to, which I thought was going to be apocalypse, but I'm still calling apocalypse will be a part of the season because mm-hmm. he's going to resurrect Gambit as his uh, horseman of death. Could be. They, he does reveal that, okay, Sebast- er, Sinister is working with somebody. Mm-hmm. And then we get the reveal that we've been waiting for, and that is Magneto is alive. Yep. And, Pad, he's hidden in a location, like a, a prison off the grid. Uh-huh. And we do see there's some music playing, Mm-hmm. And we do hear a gentleman kind of walking around mm-hmm. and exclaiming uh, what he's planning on doing. And they're also keeping tabs on the Shi'ar. Uh-huh. And, Pat, who is this? Uh, this would be the gentleman named Bastion. Yes. And voiced by Theo James. Yes. Which he was planning something, mm-hmm. and he's sitting there and reveals to Mr. Sinister, too, that, oh, yeah, Charles Xavier's alive. Uh Uh-huh. And Magneto is here. You know, like, we have plans. And he's shaving Magneto. Uh Uh-huh. And I'm going to go out on a limb. I'll be honest. I saw he was shaving. I thought he was going to go full, like, uh... Uh, Nightmare... Not Nightmare on Elm Street. Uh, Sweeney Todd and start cutting his face off. See, I don't think he was doing that. What what I thought is, like, okay, he's definitely setting up something... I think what he's going to be doing is he's going to make Magneto look like the Magneto of old. No Ooh. long hair. Because what he's going to try doing is he's going to try assimilating him. Okay. And he's because their haircuts are kind of similar in, right. in old school Magneto to right, now. Right, right. So the long haired Magneto has gone away. And it does end with Bastion basically saying like he's going to take over. Now, if anybody is not familiar with. With Bastion, and and trust me, it's perfectly fine if you're not. He is a hero or a villain. <laughs> He's no hero. I'll say that first and foremost. Who's been around since the '90s? Obviously, uh, X, Uncanny X Men 333, and he is a very very interesting character because what he is is he is a combination of Master Mold mm-hmm. and Nimrod. Well, and, and the other thing, too, is we did catch a glimpse of Nimrod in this uh-huh. episode, and I'm not talking about the intro. When Rogue was reading the mind of the dude, uh, Gyrich, in Mexico, and she ran into that mental whatever, you know, mental block, you very quickly, you know, snap of the fingers, saw like an electrical pink outline and if you know the character, you recognized it. It was Nimrod. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I saw that, and I went... Oh, shit. Yeah. The fact they're introducing Nimrod in this manner, and especially with Bastion, Brilliantly, might I add. It's brilliant. Because the thing about them is they're a very unique history. Yes. Because, long story short, they went through a portal, came out, merged, and, and like I say, uh, Sebastian, because, like I say, that's his real name. Mm-hmm. He more or less did not realize who he was. No. Until he started fully starting to, you know, grow in his hatred towards mutants and worked his way up in the government ranks, so to speak, and became the front person behind Operation Zero Tolerance. That's the OZT everybody sees. Mm-hmm. And he started working with one great in Creed, the son of Wolverine or um, Sabretooth. And the political as- aspect that was going on there, it was a really weird time, but it's one that is very well known um, from the X-Men lore of the 90s. Right. So this is very interesting to see him in here and how they can kind of play it as him being the big bad because he is going to last around for these three issues. Mm-hmm. I think what we're going to have ultimately is by the time this is done, Xavier comes back. Probably. Well, we know he's coming back because last episode uh, he saw what, a glimpse of what was going on and he got scared. Mm-hmm. He comes back. Magneto, all the goodwill that he's done is going to go away. 
Yeah, probably. By the time this is all said and done. Probably. Now, whether this is due to Bastion or not, I don't know. The online rumor that I keep hearing, and I'm going to say I don't see this happening percentage-wise, I give this a 20% chance. Okay. Is Bastion's going to cause Onslaught. Hmm. And that's the merger of Magneto's evil persona with Xavier, and it's a it's a messy uh, it's it's a messy yeah that might be a little much for and I'm not talking like gratuity or like you know just for kids' eyes that just might be a little too complicated. Well, the thing is, they can't really do it now, where they are in the comics. Sure, because uh, if I'm doing everything with the acolytes. This kind of ties into when Wolverine gets his metal ripped out. Yeah. And this is where Xavier does, like, more or less mind wipes Magneto. Right. Because out of rage. Right. So it's it's very complicated if they're going to try to do an onslaught. They'd have to wait a little bit and set it up. But that's the whole thing. I don't think we're getting that. I really don't. I think we're going to get his Bastion and, you know, Operation Zero Tolerance getting into a very, very high prestige place of power. Sure. And they're going to go build off of there. There's going to be a standoff. The X-Men are going to win, but they ultimately yeah. are going to lose Yeah, because Magneto is going to say, screw this, Charles. I did this because you were gone. You're back. Business is going back to where it should be. And I have followers that are going to see this because we let Genosha down. I also think, and this is nothing I've read and just kind of a fun speculation, I think Scott's also going to flip. Well, I think... I Be- think Because there was a moment in this episode after the uh, funeral where he was having a conversation with the president and Scott wanted things done yesterday. Mm-hmm. And the president's like, listen, there's a path, there's a reason, that, you know, this takes time, blah, blah, blah. And he did not like the response at all. And and he seemed and he he very angrily hung up on the president. This this wasn't a, like a polite click hang up. No, he pounded the off button on that with his fist. Now I'm not going to say it's going to happen in like the next episode or next year, but I'm thinking by the end of the final episode, he might flip. It's a possibility, and, it, and we might get that like iconic uh, or infamous, depending on how you look at it, uh, look he had with like the red and everything. Well, I will say this. I can see it happening because in the comics, when the Acolytes were taking form, Colossus jumps ship. Sure. So there will be an X-Men that jumps. Could it be Cyclops? Maybe. And it would make sense for the storyline in the cartoon. It would. Right. Because Magneto is going to have somebody jump ship. Cyclops being that guy makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And then... Storm is back, so Storm would take over leadership, and they can run that storyline, which, I mean, would be perfect, too. Yeah. So there is a lot of moving parts happening here, and I think that that's what we're going to get at the end of the season is Cyclops jumps ship. So I will I will side with you on that, Pat, now that you bring that up, because I have to remember everything going on with the Acolyte storyline. Mm-hmm. And once it gets rolling, it's going to get very, very complicated. We're, <laughs> we're going to Asteroid M. We're going to yeah, get messy. Yeah. And then I I tell you what would be wild is if they do the Wolverine is ripped apart from the Adamantium. Oh, give it to me. If they do that on animated. Give it to me. I know we're jumping ahead a little bit, but when by the time it's all done with Bastion, the X-Men as we know it are going to be forever changed. And not in a good way. And not in a good way because I think two villains are going to emerge and that's going to be Apocalypse with a new Four Horsemen and a new Magneto-led Acolytes and that's nothing but trouble for anybody in their path. But what an episode to lead into this. Like I say, yeah. the minute I saw this happening, I got excited because I think this is going to tie in. There's so much that reflects into the current run of the Krakoan era right now. I'm super, super pumped up and seeing Bastion, that's such a deep dive. Yeah. I love the fact of doing this. I'm still going to say I'm going to be mad if I don't see Extreme. I'm going to be mad. Eh, could happen. But, Pat, final thoughts on the episode. Thought it was a great episode. Super excited to see where things go from here in these next couple episodes. My God. I tell you what, this show has done no wrong. Even their weakest episode of the season still was a fun one, but this one right. really was making a run for the best one of the season thus far. Introducing Bastion is going to make for a lot of headaches, and with the Tolerance is <laughs> Extinction's three-part ending coming up, anything is possible, but 
obviously with Operation Zero Tolerance involved, it's going to get super, super messy. Just a little bit. So get ready for that. Hit us up on that hashtag, hashtag ODPHPod. What is your thoughts about Bright Eyes, Episode 7 from X-Men 97, currently on Disney Plus from Marvel Animation? Let's talk about it, shall we? But first, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Hey, all. I'm Frank. Join me and my friends as we talk about all things geek. Here at Geek Freaks Podcast, we go over the weekly news of everything in geekdom, from movies to TV, video games, and comic books. We also have a growing YouTube community. Join us as we go over everything in your geek life and share in the love of geekdom. Coming back for another segment on this edition of the ODPH Podcast, and we have to break down a trailer that dropped. Good Lord. Staying in the X-Men universe per se, but one that I think arguably right now is the biggest movie of the year thus far. Yeah, I would say so. And obviously with the reaction of the views online for it. Good Lord. There's no question the fan base is excited to see the return of Ryan Reynolds as Deadpool and Hugh Jackman as Wolverine in 2024's upcoming Deadpool and Wolverine movie. Yeah. Yeah. Expected to drop July 26th, directed by Sean Levy. So the first trailer kind of teased a little bit, but we've got a little more to break down. So we are going to be talking about the trailer that happened, Pat. Mm -hmm. But I know you got some numbers up there. No, yeah. uh, Well, the records it's specifically broken uh, are it's broken the record for the most number of F-bombs. In, uh, <laughs> in in one Marvel trailer, it's also broken the, mo- the record for the most number of swear words in a Marvel trailer. Low bar, but still it broke. Uh, but the YouTube video on uh, Marvel Entertainment's YouTube page, it's been up for three days. It already has ten point five, almost 10.5 million views. And that's not even counting, you know, Twitter, X, whatever, Facebook, and all the reposts. So this has got a ton of views. It definitely does, and rightfully so. The f- Fan base is super excited about it. Like we said, I think a lot of it has to do with X-Men 97 and getting the fans talking about it because obviously when we're dealing with the MCU, it is a pop culture event. This is true. And seeing how the first real X-Men movie in the MCU under Kevin Feige is going to be, people are talking. So we are going to be two of them, and we are going to break it down like we always do. Spoiler-free statement first, then a countdown. So, Pad, let's talk about it. What do you think of the trailer? thought it was a really good trailer. Easter eggs abound in this trailer, and I was already excited for this when you when you mentioned, like, oh, they're doing another Deadpool movie with Ryan Reynolds. Oh, by the way, he convinced Hugh Jackman to come back. So the fact that you couple those two things together, I sit there and go, okay, yeah, I'm in. Yeah, this one played perfectly. It gave away a lot of Easter eggs. It did not give away anything going on with the movie. I still am not sure a thousand percent what's happening. I got a hunch on one specific aspect of the plot. And once we get into spoilers, I will tell you. Exactly. But I think definitely if you haven't made plans to go see the movie now, I think after you watch this trailer, you're going to be locked and loaded and count down the days to July. Trust me. So let's get into a pad in three, two, one. Let's talk spoilers. This trailer was everything I would have hoped for. You know, it's fun. It's goofy. It's. Got the humor we're used to with the Deadpool movies, but it's got the Marvel banner behind it, you know, and what the hell comes out of this movie? I have no goddamn idea, but it's going to be fun. It's going to be absolutely amazing. This one had so many Easter eggs in, got a little more clarity about where they're going possibly with the story, so that's going to be fun to do. And just seeing how Jackman and Reynolds are playing off each other. Yeah. Like, we had always known that they've always had a great friendship, and it definitely shows anytime we see them on screen. But to see them in their two most iconic characters is really, really been a fun ride uh-huh. thus far. And as we jump in for this trailer, it opens up uh, in a shocking place. Wolverine sitting at a bar. Boy, where have I seen this before? Yeah. Almost every product ever. Christ, they did this almost exact same shot in the uh, Wolverine video game trailer. Mm-hmm. Him sitting at a bar. Yep. So bartender obviously says he's not welcome there. and Get the fuck out. Yeah, Wolverine's just basically saying... I'll leave as soon as I get a drink. And then, lo and behold, who pulls up? Hi, Peanut. Deadpool himself. Mm-hmm. And is trying to convince him, like, you need to leave with me right now. <laughs> yeah, you need to come with me. No ifs, ands, or buts. And he goes, uh, look, lady, I'm not interested. Yeah. So Deadpool is saying, well, we don't exactly have time. He tries grabbing him. At this point, too, you see Wolverine 
slowly pop his claws. Well, he tries to. It doesn't get very far. Right, and obviously uh, Wolverine or Deadpool has a comment to say about it. Uh, quote, whiskey dick of the claws is quite common in Wolverine's over 40. Yeah, but this does play into a storyline from the comics, which I think they're going to dive heavy into, and that's Old Man Logan. Yeah, So expect that. Like the re- I would say... I don't want to say the real version because we did get a lot of influence on that with Logan, yeah. the actual movie. Yeah. But this one, I think, is going to be more comic-centric. Could be. I also love the writing on the gun because they do a, fo- a close-up focus on the barrel of the gun. Smile, wait for the flash. Yep. <laughs> so Deadpool says, he's like, you know, i got this gun pointed at your forehead. I think you might want to reconsider. Wolverine leans into it and smiles. Uh-huh. So obviously we're hitting the ground running, get the little uh, shot of... The wasteland. Yep. I'm starting to think more and more in their speculation. We see a ship kind of in the background. I got a hunch that might be Titanic. It could be. Because 20th Century Fox had a part in that movie. Yes. I, th- I think this could be, this is going to be an Easter egg for not just the Fox X-Men universe, but Fox movies in general. Mm-hmm. It, it's just the fun for the after effects people. Like how many, how much stuff can we cram into the background of this movie? Yeah. But we do see them at the end of the universe, the void. You see the shot of Wolverine standing over Deadpool. like In his, in his yellow and blue costume. Mm-hmm. Then it goes quickly to Deadpool monologuing, I'll lose everybody I ever loved and cared about. You do see the shot of him and his supporting characters that we've seen throughout the two previous movies. Uh-huh. And Wolverine is basically saying, not my fucking problem. Yep. Uh, and Deadpool says, is that what you said when your world went to shit? Yep. So once that happens... Uh, you get the kind of interesting reaction of Wolverine. He says, come again. Mm-hmm. And then we get the shot of the TVA and Paradox and it basically telling Deadpool this Wolverine let his entire world down. So here's my theory okay. for this Wolverine. Remember back, and I know this is going to be some painful for some people, but bear with me. Remember back to X-Men The Last Stand? Yeah. Remember how at the end of that movie, the whole like fate of the world hinged on Wolverine killing Gene, yeah, and he did. I think in this instance, he didn't kill Gene. Ooh, he. I think we might get a flashback. We might even see the actress, Famke rep- Jansen. Uh, yeah, reprising her role as Gene for uh, a little bit. There's a lot of cameos in this movie, and there's some rumored cameos. But I think that's going to be what ultimately led this Wolverine down this path. Is he had the opportunity to stop Phoenix and couldn't do it? I will say maybe. Okay. I, I do love that theory, actually. I'm going to say, though, I don't think it's that. I think they're they're going to tie into Old Man Logan. And if you know anything about that storyline, uh, yeah, you know what he did to his world. Yeah. So I will say that's in that conversation. And I think that that might be where they're going with. We get some great action sequences. Wolverine uh, decides to put his claws on Deadpool. And, in a rather uncertain, uh, rather uncomfortable place. Yep. And we do see Deadpool decides to return the favor by shooting Wolverine in the sides. There is a scene at a diner where... Uh, should we want to talk about what's haunting you or should we wait for a third act flashback? <laughs> yeah. Perfect, perfect comedic oh, timing. Oh, it's so good. Wolverine answers with the GFY. And then we get this very, very interesting action shot as they're coming out of a uh, alleyway, shall we say? Yeah, yeah, with uh, Madonna's like a prayer uh, queuing in the background. Yep. And in the background, though, there is some stores. Yeah. Uh-huh. There's an East Side pharmacy. Yep. And then there's Liefeld's Just Feet. Uh huh. Which, Pad, break that down for us. <laughs> uh, that's in reference to the man who created Deadpool, Rob Liefeld. Uh, and it's a joke because the one thing, Rob, love you, but it's true. The one thing Rob could not draw are feet. Mm-hmm. Could draw everything else about a character. Could not draw their feet. His feet are, yeah, the feet joke has been one long standing in comics. In fact, I will say Rob had some fun with it on Twitter this week. Also want to point out another one of the stores in the background, Spider-Man villain. Kind of not a major one, but still a Spider-Man villain, Copperhead mm. in, the, in the background. Yeah. No, they, they definitely loaded up with some Easter eggs on here. Yeah. And you know, like I say, you get Deadpool saying you were an X-Men. You were the X-Men. Yeah, and Wolverine replies, trust me, kid, I'm no hero. Yeah, so it definitely goes into the same stance that Wolverine has had through the dawn of time. We do see, though, later in the sequence here, he does fully unleash his claws. Yep. So 
this, like I say, it ties back into a little bit from Old Man Logan where he refused to use his claws for the longest time. Also looks like the same forest. Yeah. Just winter. Yep, because then we get the shot of Deadpool taking out some soldiers. Then we get a shot of the villain of the movie. Mm-hmm. And this one, to clarify in case anybody was doubting, we, we said this the last time, it's Cassandra Nova. Uh-huh. And if anybody does not fully believe that she is the villain, I don't know what to say. Um, but I will just say this. She <laughs> is a very unique villain. Yes. From the Grant Morrison run on New X-Men 114 and is the quote-unquote twin sister of Charles Xavier, but it's not exactly as easy as that. Mm-hmm. She's more notably known for leading the slaughter of Genosha that you saw in X-Men 97. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, she's also somebody that in the comics forced the uh, admission of Xavier coming out publicly as a mutant. Mm. So she is a unique being to say the least, but she is nothing to be messed with. And the fact they chose her for the villain, I love the idea. I'm just, I'm curious where we're going to go with it. We do see her coming out of a skull head, which is giant man Uh or ant man. If you will, it's Hank Pym. It's that helmet. Like I say, old man Logan reference right there. Yeah. And There's also some folks standing there outside of that helmet. And who is that? Lady Death. Death Strike is there. Uh, Azaziel, I think is that how you say yep. that? Uh, Callisto's there. Ta, a Toad. Also Pyro and the Russian. Yeah, they borrowed a lot from the X Men franchise there yeah. for that scene. Yeah. So it's very, very cool to see Lots them there. Lots of cameos. Yes. Well, I mean, if this is going to be the last time we see everybody together, yeah. it makes perfect sense to do. Yep. So like we say, we get more fighting going on. All we've been hearing about is the action sequences in this movie is going to blow people away. Mm -hmm. And then we get a shot of Wolverine basically doing a fastball special through a car. (laughs) Upwards through a car. Yeah. So I'm not sure how they're going to play that out. And obviously Cassandra Nova is just in the background, just kind of contemplating everything. We do get that action shot that Pat alluded to with all the cameos there. So that is figures that we know from the X-Men movies. Mm-hmm. So there has been a lot of them in there, which, I mean, it's very cool to see because... End of the world, you're in the void. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, so they're tying in quite a few characters. Also, when it comes to the TVA and pruning uh, timelines, there's a lot of spinoffs of that timeline. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So we do see, though, there is kind of like an interesting sequence. They're just kind of doing quick flashes Yep. Here and there about where the fight is going. Yeah. And it literally boils down to a showdown between Wolverine and, and Cassandra Nova where you're seeing her use her powers to block his claws. Uh-huh. And especially, too, coming out of that fight scene, too, where there is a unique car that's getting drove by. Yeah, it's Red Skull's car from World War Two. Yeah. Which, like I say, the, there's more Easter eggs for Old Man Logan in this than I think anybody realizes. Uh-huh. So if you really want to go dive into that, you should. It's a great story. Uh, definitely have to keep an eye on that. And I know we'll be breaking that down, I think, on Turn a Page sometime when the movie is coming nearby. But then we do see, like I say, there's more flashbacks to two of the end of the world with the uh-huh. void. Do you see Dogpool? Yeah, Dogpool, which I, I yes. think we're going to see the Deadpool core there. I know there's rumor that there's going to be Lady Deadpool, which is going to be Blake Lively. Yeah, <laughs> I've, heard, I've heard that rumor. I can't confirm. That's just perfect. I've heard rumors, so I'm just going to just emphasize that. And then, like I said, we that's, get the, that's amazing. We get a lot of action on the way out the door, and it's just summed up with three simple initials: L F G. Yep, and we see everybody jump through a portal, and that's how it literally ends. And also, th- going out on a limb, that portal, Doctor Strange. Could be that would be something. Or or uh, Wong. Yeah, that could be, could be Wong. I think Wong would make more sense right now. He's technically the Sorcerer Supreme of Earth Prime or 616 or whatever it is. Yeah. And then it finishes off with this little back and forth between Blind Al and Wade uh, talking about the use of a uh, certain white powder. Yeah, it's, it's the one thing Kevin Feige said uh, they couldn't reference. Yeah. So, I mean, overall, I mean, they had a lot going on with this. Yes, they did. And many Easter eggs that we can all enjoy. Get super excited about the movie for. I mean, Pad, final thoughts on the trailer? Uh, really good trailer. Dug the hell out of it. Uh, and super excited to see this movie when it finally comes out because, boy, am I excited. Love the deep dives of the villains. Love where they were heading with everybody here. I mean, this movie is going to be a, a nice fan love letter 
to the ones that have been with it since the original X-Men movie. Mm-hmm. And I think this is going to be a nice gateway to transition into the MCU, wherever that's going to be. We still don't know. I don't think we're going to hear anything until San Diego Comic-Con at the earliest. At the earliest. But we'll have to just kind of wait and see until then. But in the meantime, let's talk about it. Hashtag ODPH pod. What is your thoughts about the latest Deadpool and Wolverine trailer? Did you love it? Did you hate it? And what is the Easter eggs that you saw that we didn't? Let's have that conversation, shall we? But first, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. You ever wondered what comics Mark from Vale of is into? What Zach from Left Behind's favorite MCU movies are? Well, Metalcore Nerds is the show for you. My name is Sean Mott, and here at Metalcore Nerds, we cover the latest things in pop culture, whether it be Star Wars, Marvel, DC, AEW, and everything else in between. You can listen to the show every Monday on Adobe Howl at 7 p.m. Eastern, or find it anywhere you find podcasts after it debuts on the radio station. Coming back for another segment on this edition of the ODPH Podcast, and... The end is almost here. Yes. It's scary to think that Clone Force 99 is going to say a fond farewell to everybody. But yet here we are, episode 14 of season three of Star Wars The Bad Batch. Hell yeah. And this one definitely had a lot of things going on with it entitled Flash Strike. So you know the deal by now. Spoiler free countdown. Spoiler talk. Pad. Let's talk about it. Spoiler-free statement on Flash Strike. I won't go into spoilers until we get to that portion, but I will say they gave away or hinted at part of the ending of this series, and it's going to be fucking amazing. That being said, this episode was incredible, too. Loved it from start to finish. And the implications for what's going to happen. I don't know if anybody's ready for what's going to happen in the next episode, but it's going to be awesome. I thought they set this up very nicely. I, I almost felt like they needed one more episode. Mm-hmm. Like that was the only thing. Knowing that it's the penultimate, that threw me off a little bit. Mm-hmm. But they still did a nice job setting some things up. I'm very curious about where they're going to head into. I know you're the aficionado of Six or Seven podcasts concerning Star Wars. They gave it away, <laughs> so I know you're going to have a lot to dive into on that spoiler talk. But they definitely have me excited going into the finale. And then next week's, oh, it's going to be a tough one, Pat. I know. It's going to be a tough one right before May the 4th. I know. It's oh. like they planned it that way. I'd say those Star Wars folks, they know what they're doing over there. But let's talk about the latest episode that was on Disney+, Plus, Star Wars The Bad Batch, uh, Flash Strike. Let's get into that spoiler talk, shall we? So three, two, one. It's Mike is yours. Like I said, thought the episode was awesome. They tipped their hand a little bit, although given the circumstances, Totally understand why they would, because I'm excited as all hell to see it happen. Uh, this is going to come back to bite the Empire in the ass spectacularly, and we will. Ha- we have been waiting for this to come and back bite them in the ass for 14 years now, but I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, but now the episode was awesome, and I'm excited and also sad for the series finale next week. They're all going to get killed off. Nah. <laughs> well, sorry. they might be collateral, that's for damn sure. I th- I think there's at least one that's not making it to next week or out of next week alive, and that's Probably. Crosshair. Probably. Crosshair, I think, is done. But we do see that the Bad Batch has finally made their way to Tantus mm-hmm. in search of Omega. Yep. So Clone Force 99 has definitely shown up and is ready to take the fight to the Empire. Win, lose, or draw. So everybody's favorite clones are in the base. Mm-hmm. and They're we- outside it. Yep. So once the, they're picked off, that they're infiltrating the station pad, mm-hmm. what happens? Uh, they get shot down. They get shot down in, into the canopy or the forest of the base. Uh, they cannot make it. They, they cannot communicate. They get separated. They cannot communicate with each other because uh, that'll we're, the, we're on the kind of the same equipment the Empire is using, so that'll tip them off real quick. So they got to make it through there, basically just talking to each other while they're there. I love the one part where uh, Rampart, <laughs> they're not sure if Rampart survived. And, and wh- I forget which one. One of them asks, oh, is, did, did, did Rampart survive? And the other one goes, oh, unfortunately, yes. Yeah. So and you just hear Rampart pipe up. I'm right here. Yeah, no, that was a fun moment. <laughs> with everything going on, that was fun. But yeah, so now they have to sneak through the jungle with the entire base's security on high alert. And they, the base ends up sending a uh, stormtrooper uh, squad out to the crash site, and they report back, yeah, there's nobody here, at which point the base's security go, all right, fan out and do a sweep. We need to find them. Mm-hmm. So tension is running high as the stormtroopers are, are absolutely tearing apart 
the surroundings trying Ooh. to find Wrecker, Hunter, and Crosshair, and Rampart too. Yeah. So it is making things a little difficult for their mission to get Omega. Mm-hmm. But it also helps Omega in the long run here. Yes. Because obviously with the base distracted, Pat, what does she do? Uh, she starts planning on the escape route for her and the other captives inside the base. Because, hey, they're not really paying attention to us all that much. Why don't we use this opportunity to figure out how the hell we're going to get out of here? Yeah, so she's leading the charge about escaping this and getting everybody out alive. So it is a very, very cool moment to see that she is now tearing apart the worst constructed base on the planet. Yeah. Because, let's face it, whoever is doing the construction for the Empire, they leave a lot of loopholes mm-hmm. all over the place. Mm-hmm. And she, Omega has taken full advantage of that. She's not wasting any time. Mm-hmm. And then, well, she happens to bump into something. <laughs> and I'm going to let you take this one. <laughs> oh, this is going to fuck the Empire over so badly. Uh, no, so she ends up coming across a certain beast. If you're a Clone Wars fan, you knew what this was instantly. I knew what this was instantly. And I started cackling and going, oh, shit, it's going to finally bite him in the ass. So for those of you who don't know, the beast she finds in, although if you had it with subtitles on, you know who it was. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the beast she runs into is known as a Zillow beast, which was native to the planet of Malastair. Uh, roughly ran about 318 feet tall. Uh, 97 meters in height. Uh, weighed about 60, and I'm going off the Star Wars fandom page. Uh, weighed about 60,000 metric tons. Thing was huge. Uh, I'm showing kind of picture of just how yeah, gargantuan this thing is. That's mammoth. That's the that's the gunship they would use. That's the fucking beast. Yeah. Uh, definitely pays homage to Godzilla and the Godzilla films from back in the day. Uh, if you want to get a little preview of this of this monster, uh, go watch uh, season two, episodes 18 and 19 of the Clone Wars. Uh, they specifically uh, regard to the Zillow beast. Because this beast shows up on a planet, they then bring it back to Coruscant because of course they fucking do. Mm-hmm. Because the issue with this beast is lightsabers don't affect it. Yeah. Conventional blaster shots do not affect it. The only thing that really knocks it out for the count is the the fuel, the gas, whatever you want to call it, on Malastare in gas form. That that's the only thing that kills it. So Palpatine, at the time when he's he's uh, Chancellor, goes, "Hey, that'd make really good armor, and he, and why don't we bring it back to Coruscant? And they bring it back to Coruscant. You can expect the antics that in, that ensue. Uh, and and to spoil it a little bit, but you should still watch the episodes. The Beast ends up getting killed, and they go and they pull a sample from it at the end of the episode, and he's and he's looking for a way to clone it." Hmm. And then we find out later, yeah, no, they 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 ended up cloning the, they ended up cloning the damn thing because it ends up showing it, 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 they end up cloning the damn thing clearly, uh, and they've got it under uh, lock and key. You want to know how how Omega and the crew are going to get out? They're going to ride that fucking thing. Yeah, because you cannot stop it. You can just you know delay it. It'll be never-ending story. Essentially, yeah. It's going to be amazing. I'm here for that. And like I said, we've been waiting. We like Star Wars fans have been sitting there going, this is a bad idea that you're trying to do anything with this monster. Like, you cannot control it. We've been waiting 14 years to see this bite the Empire and bite Palpatine in the ass. It's going to finally do it. Pat is so excited, folks. Oh, my God. It's going to be amazing. Oh, I say we might have to live stream this. All, we, like, all we're going to need, I know it won't happen, but all we're going to need in this episode is for all of the kids to come out of the base on top of the Zillow Beast while I while I need a hero plays in the background. Oh. I need a hero. Oh, my God. That will be out of control. That's all we need. Oh, my God. Well, I can just I see I see that playing out, though. It's going to be so good. It'll be fun, though. But back in the jungle aspect of Tantus, Mm -hmm. we do see Rampart uh, is trying to run away and accidentally uh, wakes up a monster. Yeah. Yeah. So whoops. So it's a mad scramble to get away from said creature, Mm -hmm. and he gets separated and captured. Yeah. In the process. Yep. So things are going to get a little hectic there. Yep. We do see, though, Echo has infiltrated the base. Yep. And encounters who? Emiri, uh, I think is how you say the name. That is the uh, person in charge of all the kids. Yeah. And she's she's clearly not buying into what the Empire is selling these days. Yeah. So when the big reveal is happening, the dominoes are now set in place. Yep. To go save Omega, even though Omega's already figured out a way to get out. Uh-huh. 
And now all bets are off going into that finale. The uh, final episode is titled The Cavalry Has Arrived. I'm going with that's got two meanings. I agree too. Clone Force 99 and a certain Zillow Beast. Yeah, I, th- I think we're going to have a big dramatic ending. Like I said, I don't think somebody's making it out alive. I think it's Crosshair. Uh, probably not. Yeah. Probably not. I, mm, I'm going to say Echo. It could be. I just because every, the story of Echo and his clones are just tragic. Um, don't want to spoil that if you haven't seen Clone Wars, but I, I think Echo might not make it out of the episode. Well, like I guess, and, and it's it's gonna emotionally wreck me. Yeah, I, I'm expecting a lot of action going into the Star Wars universe going into next week. So a fun episode though, and the calm before the storm, mm-hmm. probably. So definitely, let's talk about it. Hit us up on the hashtag hashtag ODPH Pod. What is your thoughts about Flash Strike episode 14 of the final season of Star Wars: The Bad Batch, currently airing on Disney Plus? Let's talk about it. But we gotta get a quick breakout, so we're gonna do that, and then we'll be right back. Hey guys, it's Alan Dunford here from Top Hat Studios, co-writer and co-creator of Pocus Hocus and Grandma Chainsaw, and you guys are listening to the ODPH podcast. Coming back for the final segment on this edition of the ODPH podcast, Pat, what you got? Got a couple things to talk about, the first of which should excite Lord of the Rings fans. Do you need another excuse to see the movies in theaters? <laughs> oh, jeez. Well, if no. Is that your question? Yeah, yeah, really. If no, if you don't, well, then boy, do I have the opportunity for you. Reading from an article on HollywoodReporter.com, it says, quote, Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings trilogy is coming back again, but it's a bit different this time. Warner Brothers and Fathom Events are teaming to re-release the Oscar-winning fantasy blockbuster this summer. Hmm. The versions screened will be the Jackson's Extended Editions, so you might want to get the uh, jumbo tub of popcorn, and also the versions that the filmmaker remastered in 2020 for a 4K Ultra HD release. Re-release. This is the first time the remastered versions will be in theaters. Uh, I have seen them at a friend's house myself. They are gorgeous. Uh, article goes on to say the screenings will start with 2001's The Fellowship of the Ring on June 8th, then Ju- uh, 2002's The Two Towers on June 9th, followed by 2003's The Return of the King on June 10th. Tickets are now up on the Fathom event site. Uh, close quote. Uh, so definitely check this out if you're a Lord of the Rings fan. I will give you personal advice though. I myself went to with my fiance Liz Bailey to the screening at one of our local theaters because last year was the 20th anniversary for Return of the King. I do not need an excuse to see that movie in theaters again. There are multiple scenes I would love to re uh, relive in theaters, and I took that opportunity to. It was the extended edition. That movie is four, four and a half hours, something like that. Yeah. There was no bathroom break. Oh, geez. It was, and plus there was like a 20 minute intro video from Elijah Wood for some Lord of the Rings board game, card game, whatever the hell it was that he was supporting at the time. But yeah, forewarning for those of you going to see these movies, odds are they're not doing a bathroom break. So plan accordingly. Uh, Then we got to talk about a trailer that came out just the other day from the folks over at Disney Plus. And I got to admit, did not know this was coming, but I'm certainly going to be watching this come out when it comes out. And that is uh, streaming on Disney Plus on May 31st. It is the original documentary from director Ron Howard titled Jim Henson, Idea Man. Yeah. And the description of this reads, and I'm reading from the description on the YouTube uh, video on the Disney Plus YouTube, quote, never stop creating. Jim Henson, Idea Man, a Disney Plus original documentary from Academy Award, uh, Academy Award winning filmmaker Ron Howard is streaming May 31st. Jim Henson, Idea Man, takes us into the mind of this singular creative visionary from his early years puppeteering on local television to the worldwide success of Sesame Street, The Muppet Show, and beyond. Featuring unprecedented access to Jim's personal archives, Howard brings us a fascinating and insightful look at a complex man whose boundless imagination inspired the world, close quote. So the, I grew up on uh, Sesame Street, as I know everyone for like the last three, four generations did. Uh, Muppets, I love the absolute hell out of. Uh, everything Jim Henson did was incredible. I know some people are skeptical about this just because whatever reason and, you know, stuff in the past. The thing that gives me kind of, you know, warm feelings about it. One, uh, Frank Oz is in it. And Mm. I know and I know Frank Oz has been very vocal about, you know, the relationship Disney has with the Muppets franchise. 
And also, it's got his family in it. And by his family, I mean Jim Henson's family. Mm-hmm. Some of the family members are taught. So I feel like if it wasn't going to be at least a tasteful, fun look back, the family wouldn't be involved in it in any way, shape, or form. But this, nonetheless, definitely one for you, your parents, your siblings to watch when it comes out on May 31st. Also, you go to watch the trailer, bring some tissues because those evil fiends decided to use uh, Rainbow Connection yeah, in the trailer. Damn it. <laughs> Definitely got us, Misty Eyed. Oh, my God. Yeah, I was not expecting to get hit like that. I'm it like, looks mm. so good, though. It looks good. It looks yeah. very, very good. I'm definitely checking that out. Then we have to switch over to some Harry Potter news. And no, it's not anything to do with the HBO series that's coming down the line. No, it's it's the book specifically. And no, there's not an eighth book coming. We don't talk about the Cursed Child book. No, this is uh, in regards to the audiobooks, uh, which, side note, if you haven't listen to the harry potter audiobooks either by jim dale uh or the other one i'm blanking on the name uh, uh stephen fry mm. uh definitely give those a listen to they're awesome uh but no reading from an article on variety.com the article reads quote listen up potterheads jk rowling's seven original harry potter books are getting a massive new audiobook series amazon's audible and pottermore publishing the global digital publishing of rowling's wizarding world will co-produce a brand new audiobook series for the original seven Harry Potter stories. The new audiobooks are scheduled to premiere in late 2025, with each of the seven language, English language titles to be released sequentially uh, for a global audience exclusively on Audible. The companies said the full cast audio productions with more than 100 actors will bring these iconic stories to life as never heard before. The new audiobooks will provide immersive audio entertainment through high-quality sound design in Dolby Atmos, stunning scoring, a full range of character voices, and real-world sound capture, Audible and and Pottermore Publishing said. The original single-voice English-language Harry Potter audiobooks featuring Stephen Fry and Jim Dale will continue to be available. These were first published in 1999 since they uh, since they launched on Audible in 2015. The audiobooks have reached 1.4 billion global listening hours in total. Uh, further details on the new Harry Potter audiobooks, including content and production, global release dates, voice casting, and how to access the audiobooks will be released later. The project is unrelated to the eight Warner Brothers movies chronicling the saga of... Uh, uh, is unrelated to the... Uh, eight Warner Brothers movies chronicling the saga of the boy wizard, close quote. So this is essentially going to be fucking bonkers because the thing with the audiobooks, they're great. Jim Dale and, and Stephen Fry do fantastic jobs, but they do all of the voices. They do inflections. They do this. They do that. To, to, but with these, that's not going to be the case. You're going to have an actress playing Hermione. She's going to be the only actress playing Hermione. It's not going to be one person doing a thousand different voices. You'll have somebody for Harry, somebody for Ron. All of the characters that have a speaking part in the book series will have their own actors. They're going to have background noise. So it's going to sound like you're actually there with the characters as the story is progressing. This, if, if you've listened to the Star Wars stuff, minus you know just the Mark Thompson stuff, I know they've done some full cast audio stuff for the Star Wars books going to be a lot similar to the star wars stuff with the full audio music in the background and those are some of my favorite audiobooks is when they do the full production this is going to be awesome yeah that definitely sounds interesting i mean your fandom is a lot bigger than mine sure for that but it still definitely sounds like an interesting project yeah uh then we're sticking with some uh streaming news and we got some news that not entirely surprising, but a little bit surprising. And that is The Witcher is going to be ending with season five. Ooh. Yeah, so reading from an article on Variety.com, it says, quote, Netflix's fantasy series The Witcher has been renewed for season five, which will be the end of the series the streamer announced Thursday morning. It also confirmed that season four is now in production and it will film back to back with season five. Season four will be the first with Liam Hemsworth replacing Henry Cavill as the lead character Geralt of Rivia. Netflix announced in October 2022 that Cavill would be departing the show after the third season, which aired in the summer of 2023 in two parts. Uh, Close quote. So not entirely surprising. You know, that seems to be the norm for Netflix is, you know, four or five seasons and then kind of duck out and go. Mm. But still surprising that they made the announcement. Yeah, but, you know, I I think it's kind of run its course. Yeah, I do, I do, too. Yeah, I mean, they got so much stuff coming on this year. I mean, yeah. I think they want to end it on a high note. They don't want to hang around too long, so yeah. it makes sense to me. Yeah. Then, got to talk some video game news. And did you know that I am unofficially mentioned 
in a uh, science science research paper. I mean, I wouldn't doubt it, but... Uh, if this is true. So reading from an article on Forbes.com, uh, the article reads, quote, Four years ago, players of the video game Borderlands 3 got to access got access to a new minigame called Borderlands Science. Within the main game, players came across a, an arcade machine on which they could briefly take a break from the main story to play simple tile align, a simple tile alignment game. Since then, 4.5 million gamers took on the challenge and played the Borderlands Science minigame. In doing so, they helped researchers learn more about the evolution of more than a million types of bacteria. Uh, no knowledge of biology was needed to be able to play the minigame. So how did the players help out? They effectively took over a task that computers tend to struggle with, correctly aligning short overlapping genetic sequences. Genetic material of any organism is formed over uh, of very long strands of DNA or RNA. Uh, to figure out the genetic code, the order to, of the different nu nucleotides uh, needs to be decoded. The decoding is usually done in small chunks, but it's not possible to process an entire full-length strand at once. The shorter pieces overlap. For example, if you were reading words instead of DNA, by this method you might end up with some chunks that say B-O-R-D-E, R-D-E-R-L, or E-R-L-A-N, uh, and figure out uh, from the overlapping segments that the full word would have been Borderlands. It works the same with genetic sequencing, but in some situations, the software that does the overlapping struggles to find the genetic code from the pieces. Uh, even when computers struggle, humans are very good at this matching task. The problem is that there are far too many pieces for any individual to map. You would need many people to help out. So, as an additional method of finding the overlap, these genetic fragments were turned into colored tiles for Borderlands Science Minigame. Anyone who played the game by matching these tiles was effectively also lining up pieces of genetic material to form a more complete genetic code for microbes. Uh, it's not the first time a game was used for this task. The McGill University researchers who created the Borderlands minigame also made a similar game called Philo, but that was a standalone game that was much more directly linked to science. With science-themed games like that, researchers are relying on help from people who are already science fans to volunteer their time by implementing a game directly into already popular video game like Borderlands 3. They suddenly had access to more players. Close quote. So... This game got played by 4.5 million people, myself included, and we got to help science. And now it is effectively, uh, it's mentioned, like, it's not every player's name, but it mentions in, like, the list of sources and all this stuff, uh, like, all of the 4.5 million Borderlands players who helped with this research study. Hmm. So well, I helped the science paper. See? Not only statistician to the stars, but mm -hmm. superhero to science. Yeah. Oh, man. So, that being said, we got a lot of comic stuff going on this week. One of the, the craziest lineups, I think, in recent memory. So, Pad, what are you picking up? Uh, so, the first thing I'm picking up this week is from the folks over at Marvel Amazing Spider-Man, issue number 48 from Zeb Wells. It's got one of your favorite characters in it. Well, I okay, well, I will clarify this. Okay. I don't mind Ben Riley as long as he's a villain. Mm. Okay, like, am I saying he's my favorite? No. But... As long as he's not the super heroic wannabe Spider-Man, sure. I, I can tolerate him. And I think him as Chasm there, sure. uh, I think works. Uh, but the description of this reads, Peter Parker versus Ben Riley. Spider-Man finally gets a rematch. Meanwhile, what is going on with Norman Osborn? Only two issues left until Amazing Spider-Man issue number 50. Yeah, that one's got a lot it's of people. Awesome. Yeah, that, that's, the 50's got a lot of people talking right now because uh, reasons. Uh, next up is also from the folks on Marvel. It is Star Wars, Darth Maul, black, white, and red, which is effectively his color scheme, but eh, you get it. Uh, written by Benjamin Percy, of all people. Mm. This one reads, Darth Maul stars in his very own horror blockbuster. A prison ship transporting a cult known as the Final Oculation uh, goes offline, and Darth Maul is sent by Palpatine to investigate. What he finds on board is the stuff of nightmares. And it's up to him to stop this profoundly dark and unstable force that wishes to bring chaos to the galaxy. Did I say Benjamin Piercy writing? I'm uh -huh. definitely I'm definitely planning on picking that up. Uh, then you've got Star Wars Django Fett, issue number two from Ethan Sachs. This one reads, quote, The greatest bounty hunter in the galaxy in the crosshairs of a dangerous rival. Django Fett is after a stolen artifact at the center of a planet-wide war, but the hunter is being hunted by the notorious Aura 
Singh. Hmm. What is the secret conspiracy that threatens them all? Anytime you get Aura Singh. Highly underrated character, I would say. I would say so. So, uh, super excited to read that. And then lastly, certainly not leastly, from the folks over at Dark Horse Comics, you have Star Wars The High Republic Adventures, issue number five from Daniel Jose Older. Uh, this one reads, On the edge of Republic space, Zine, Lula, and a small Republic fleet launched a surprise attack on a Nihil prison ship. It's a daring rescue attempt, but their hope is to find and free missing allies. Now that they've found their way, fought their way in, Will they be able to fight their way out? Hmm. Hmm. We'll see. Definitely have to keep an eye on that as we go. Yep. So for me, oh man, I got, I have loaded. Like I say, this is a wild week that we had to take a look at. But kicking off for me, a pair from Comixology Originals, one of my favorite imprints. And super excited to hear this is coming to print. I don't think it was any question of when, but we did get a release date of December 18th via Dark Horse Comics. And that is the conclusion for now, of By a Thread. Mm. So this is the story written by Scott and Snyder and his son Jack and Valeria Focosia on the artwork. And this lived up to expectation. This was never a question of like a letdown anywhere. This has got so many different elements going on with adventure, a little bit of like anime style to it, you know, high drama, end of the world stuff going on. This has just had everything I was looking for. And once this got going, the finale really kicked into high gear. Absolutely love this issue. I think it's, uh, the whole series has been on point, too. And can't wait to talk about it a little more so in the upcoming months, maybe. Fingers crossed. Little teaser, dot, dot, dot. Mm. Also from Comixology Originals is an imprint that, if you know Parlay Points, I was covering the series from the beginning, Red Tag. This is a new imprint uh, book coming out from Stout, Stout Club. So Felipe Calicio and Felipe Guantanabe. And this is Mistland. So this has got like a, a kind of like a Game of Thrones esque Dungeons and Dragons a little bit kind of vibe to it. Like a, just like I say, with how it's a secret colony inside of a mountain, and you're seeing just like the different families fighting amongst each other, and things are kind of building up to a feature a, a fever pitch, and then the ending is going to throw you completely off. So this is something that, like I say, it's a little different. But I really dug it. I thought for a first impression, it really caught my attention. It was not something I was originally planning on, right. but definitely won me over. So very excited to check that out. And like I said, Stout Club puts out some really cool stuff, too. They've been doing it for a while. Like I said, Red Tag was the first book I picked up from them. Really enjoyed that one. So thinking this one's going to be another big monster for them as well. From DC Comics, it was very sad to hear that the series was ongoing, and now it will be wrapping up at issue 12. Mm. Uh, also heard about Blue Beetle is getting canceled too. Um, oh, that's too bad. Yeah, very sad about that. I really thought what the team had been doing over there was really on point, but uh, they did announce that it will be coming to an end at issue 12, as well as this series that, are, that I, I was breaking down. And this is one from Tom King and Rafael De La Torre, and that's The Penguin. So number nine dropped. And this has been an interesting story about The Penguin's return to Gotham. If you've been following Batman comics for a while, uh, he kind of faked his own death and has been brought back in for reasons to Gotham City. And this is picking up where he is now in the crossfire of his own children. So Ooh. interesting story going on here. Uh, very, very much a, a story building setup here. And I think this is going to just point to an explosive finale, which I'm all in for. I think that yeah. Tom, Tom King, I know, is kind of very polarizing for some fans. Some people really enjoy his takes. Some people just can't get into it because he really dives into like a lot of like the psychological profiles mm -hmm. and really brings like a human element to it. And I love the take that he's done with the Penguin. I think it's been real fun. I'm just sad to see the series is getting canceled uh, or concluding, I should say. I don't think it's officially canceled, but it is announced that it will be done at 12. So definitely want to read up on that before it gets all said and done. And then, obviously, it's a big week for our friends over at Boom Studios. One of my favorite series comes out is Returning, and that's Something is Killing the Children, number 36, James Tynan, Werther Del Edera, and really, really fun story. Uh, they're diving back into Erica Slaughter's history. So we're getting a little behind the scenes of what's going on with how she came to be the hunter that we all know she is. And this one, it's a self-contained story, but it's one that packs an emotional punch. Tynan is really crushing it on this, obviously with the writing and the art team always kills it too. 
So a lot of fun things happening here. I'm just happy to see the series is back. I know after issue 35, it left an emotional imprint, I'm telling you right now. So seeing it back is definitely very cool. Also, if you're looking for something from James Tynan 2 and Christian Ward, Spectagraph number one by Distillery. Pad will not read this because this is a horror story. Hell no. But this is a very, very cool ghost story. But like I say, Pad won't read it because he doesn't read horror comics. But it's a phenomenal read. Really interested to see where they're going with the setup for this. Uh, expecting big things from this book. I know it's been one of the most anticipated ones from Distillery since it was announced coming out of the Devil's Cut. So definitely lived up to my expectations. Definitely want to talk to some fans about this over the weekend as well. From our good friends over at Skybound Entertainment and Image Comics, the conclusion of the origin of Duke in the Energon universe. So Duke number five, Joshua Williamson, Tom Riley, really lived up to the hype. Uh, This book just was nonstop adrenaline, high action all over the place. Riley and Jordi Belair's artwork, just phenomenal on this and really took it to a, a whole new level. The ending is going to have some fans talking, and I, I'm super excited to see where we're going with this uh, coming out of this series. But Joshua Williamson, the two series he's written thus far have been absolutely on point. Very excited about both of them. Cobra Commander is going to be coming up on its ultimate issue too. So a lot of things happening in the Energon universe going into uh, its next full calendar year. So super excited to check that out. Yeah. And last but certainly not least from our good friends over at Marvel Entertainment, Rise of the Powers of X, number four. Uh Uh-oh. So this is bookending the end of the Cohen era, and this is a series that after last issue, I was not sure what to expect we were getting here. We got some stuff going down here. The traitor of the X-Men is revealed, and it's a big one, and it's now starting to tie everything together. To going into that big epic legacy 700 issue dropping in June. So really thought this was a cool issue. Really want to talk to some fans about this one because I, this is like, it's, you're seeing a lot of parallels between this and X-Men 97 a little bit. Ooh. So I love what I'm seeing here. And I thought that the team absolutely crushed it there. A lot of great books out of the comic shops this week. If you're looking for more reviews, nerdinitiative.com over 25 reviews this week, Pat. Over wow. 25. Wow. That's how much the bullpen is bringing. So if you want to talk comics, there's no place other that you want to go than the home of pop culture positivity. That said, for anything and everything that is the ODPH, you can find it at odphpodcast.com. That's it for this week. So for the one and only Pat Awanje. Thank you. Thank you. I'm your host, Ken. I'm thank you as always for listening to the ODPH podcast. We'll see you next time.